Good morning, Victory family and friends. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we rejoice. We are glad in it. My name is Paul. I'm privileged to serve as pastor of Victory Church of Charlottesville, where we exist to see people reconciled to God and to each other. Uh, thank you for taking 29 minutes of your time this morning uh, to, to study scripture and to worship to worship with us. We've been in a sermon series this month of August entitled Philippians, where we have just uh, been going through the book of Philippians um, as we read through the entire book in this month. First week, we just spent some time framing our conversation and discussion. Um, we emphasized then that we can only pass on that which we have received, and we highlighted Apostle Paul's greeting to the church at Philippi of grace and peace. Uh, the second week, last week, um, in looking at all of chapter one, we emphasized that God's power can make a pulpit out of our pain. This week, we're going to look at chapter two. Hopefully, you've read it prior to today. Again, so many points and things that I pray God illuminates for you, and we will highlight uh, uh, just a couple of, of those points today. Um, so turn with me again to the book of Philippians, which is in the New Newer Testament, and we're going to look at chapter two chapter 2. Um, as you find that, uh, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to study the Word of God. I pray that you would open up our eyes so that we would see all of the wonderful things that are in your law for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Philippians chapter 2, uh, we're going to read all of the 30 verses this morning, so you can read with us. We'll be uh, reading from the New International Version. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross." Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of, of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and serving coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Verse 19, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy has proved himself because he's a son. Uh, because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him to you as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honor people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves 
could not give me. Amen. Amen. If you've been with Victory at any amount of time, particularly in our in-person services, you know I may read seven or eight verses, sometimes two or three. And so this is a bit more than usual, but there's something about reading, and I pray that you've read with me, um, the scriptures allowed with each other uh, that in and of itself preaches. And certainly this letter um, from the Apostle Paul to the church at Philippi does that. We will lift a couple of things from it. Um, during our time together, and I pray that God will continue to illuminate for you as he does when we study his scripture, that which he wants you to also uh, see. The title of the message this morning is, is Pay Attention. Pay Attention. And it, it, it is, uh, in fact, the, the, the main point of the message today as well. Pay Attention. Um, I feel like all of us, and maybe I'll just say 99% of us because I can't say with any sort of degree of certainty that it's all of us, but I believe all of us could write a book about this pandemic, exercising in this pandemic, shopping in this pandemic, grieving in this pandemic, working in this pandemic, homeschooling in this pandemic, racism in this pandemic, parenting in a pandemic. That one, of course, I feel like there can be multiple volumes Certainly of all the others that I just referenced, there could also be multiple volumes. There are so many sermons, if you will, that can be preached. And if I were not as mindful as I try to be and concerned about how my kids may not want to hear every sermon analogy be about them when they get older, or have people say things to them when they're older that they wonder, how did they know that? <laughs> I'd share many. Um, and shout out to my own mother and father who now when I go back and listen to sermons, I'm grateful for the discretion they used in not putting all of our business out there just because it could preach well. Anyway, having said all of that, our kids, <laughs> we love them. We're learning so much with them in this season and every season. But one of the things that we've talked about with them is what it looks like to pay attention to each other. If one is crying or one is upset or one is having a difficult time, that, that that is not necessarily the time to see what toy they've abandoned that I've been waiting on, but rather to go and see what, what's going on. How might I serve you? Check in with your brother. Checking in with your sister. And if we're building a fort like our kids just did yesterday, what might it look like to do so together with our collective wisdom in unity? How much more powerful might it be if you together put together that marble run and then looked at it and said, wow, I had that part. You had that part. Look at what we produced together. One band, one sound, all the movie cliches, right? There's something about doing things together. And actually, speaking of movies, my wife and I recently watched on Netflix uh, a movie called The Dawn Wall which was a story about a gentleman named Tommy Caldwell and his climbing partner, Kevin Horhenson. And they were climbing the down wall, which is a really, really difficult section of El Capitan in Yosemite National Park. And at one point, Tommy, uh, who was an incredible phenom at rock climbing, uh, had gotten ahead of Kevin. He had kind of gotten past these certain impasses. I forget what they're called now, but um, and, and he'd gotten past a really difficult one and it was almost several sort of steps ahead. At night, they would kind of uh, uh, belay down, I think is what it's called, to their, to their camp on the mountain where they would just talk about the day. And, and it got to the point where it, it was thought, and even the narrators and commentators would saying, gosh, Tommy's been trying to do this his whole life. He's finally there, but it seems like Kevin may just be holding him up. He's not staying with him. Should he just go on and maybe ask Kevin, hey, just abandon ship and, and come and support me? Kevin even at one point says, look, I, I just... Maybe I just support him, help him get to what his dream has been forever. And Tommy would have certainly done that. And I, even if I'm honest as a viewer and watching and you kind of feel that you're like, you've been, you've been working at this, Tommy, go. And I have to even examine that. Where does that come from in all of us, right? Like to pursue our interests at all costs, even if others are left behind. Long story short, they finished the wall together. And as great a feat as it might have been for Tommy to maybe have finished in less time, Tommy was the main one who said to Kevin, I want you to finish this with me. It won't be the same. Yes, I will have accomplished a lifelong dream, but together there's more power when we do it. And so they did it together. 
And isn't that like us? Isn't it like us to at times feel like, man, if I could just get mine? Even our relationship with Jesus Christ, if we're honest, it's just that. It's my personal relationship with God. Community, don't really need it. It's about me and Jesus. I'm good. The church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites anyway. And of course, I'm not one of them. (laughs) So let me just get mine. Apostle Paul here had just ended chapter one by calling them into authentic Christian living, reminding them that suffering for Christ is also a gift. It's not just about trusting in him, but it's suffering with him. And then he's encouraging them by sharing that he shares in their trials, he shares in their struggles. He's writing, after all, from prison. And so he said, therefore, which when there's a therefore, we need to find out what it is there for. And I just referenced a bit of uh, what it's there for. Having said all of that to the church at Philippi in at the end of chapter one, he says, now, therefore, in an exhortation of sort, if Christ means anything to you, if you care at all, if his love really matters to you, if you really value being in this community of the spirit, then pay attention to this. Don't just be a collection of Christian people. Be a community. I've read that a horse on its own can pull somewhat of, I think upwards of 8,000 pounds. If I'm wrong, somebody throw in the chat what it actually can pull. But I read that somewhere. It can pull upwards of 8,000 pounds. Um, Some of y'all probably, I know you can bench that. I'm happy for you. But to me, that's a lot of weight. Two horses, though, doesn't just pull 16,000 pounds. Pulls like three times the weight, 24,000 pounds. When communities are on one accord, embodying the cause of Christ, not just the cause of any one person or even a collection of personal interests, when we pay attention to what's happening corporately, when we turn in our personal selfish ambition, which we all have, in exchange for a passion to see others thrive, what might happen? When we, in essence, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, when we frame our lives in accordance with his great example, when we, as Matthew chapter 11, 29 says, take on his yoke and learn from him, for he is gentle and humble in heart. When What in our communities, when we do that, might be transformed? What 24,000 pounds might we move? Verse 6 says that though he existed in the form of God, he did not consider it something to be grasped, something to use to his advantage. The hypostatic union, as it's referred to, is, is the reality that Jesus existed as fully human and he existed as fully God. Mysterious, no doubt to us, but which upon which our entire faith rests. And yet he did not leverage or lean on his divine nature as he could, but instead chose to, as verse 7 says, make himself nothing of no reputation, the King King James Version says, to empty himself. And the Greek word there, and it's not by the Greek of God that we're saved, it's by the grace of God. And yet the Greek oftentimes help us get closer to the original meaning of the text. And the Greek terminology there is kenosis, empty, void, to lay aside equality with God or well, the form of God, he chose to lay aside that honor, the majesty, the glory that was appropriately attributed to God, taking instead on the form of a servant in order to redeem the world. There is no natural analogy. There's no natural effort that could ever come close to articulating the, 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 the gravity and the weight of the incarnate deity, God in flesh, and all that God accomplished through his son, Jesus Christ. However, we do get to participate. And what a privilege. What an honor. The psalmist says, who am I, Lord, that you are even mindful of me? He even knows the number of hairs on some of our heads. He, he's mindful of us and gives us the privilege to partner as imperfect beings with the perfect being. We get to be then conduits, as I often like to say, conduits through whom God's power can redeem that which is still being lost right now. The marriages, maybe your own or others in your sphere of influence that are on the brink of breakdown right now. God might work through our collective humility and servanthood to redeem. We're kicking off our marriage group tonight. 
There are young people in our community whose brilliance is being used for evil that we can participate well with God in redeeming for good. Those in our community who are working incredibly hard and still paying 90% of their salary to their income or to their rent rather. 90% of their income goes to living expenses in a space so they can live in a space where they can be close to public transportation to get to the jobs that they are working so diligently at. Might we participate in redeeming the circumstances that so easily facilitate and exacerbate such conditions? We have parents now who are trying to figure out what does it look like to put food on the table and facilitate the education of our kids in the fall online. What does that look like? Let this mind be in you, Paul says. Not a democratic mind, not a, a Republican mind. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, the one who sat with tax collectors, the one who healed on the Sabbath. The one who liberated the oppressed, the one who started the first movement, might I say, promoting equity. If there was a hashtag, it would have been Gentile Lives Matter. Might we have the same mindset of, of Jesus Christ and preferring others, putting what privilege we have or leveraging it even for gain for others, not necessarily for our own. Paying attention, paying attention to us, to our sphere of influence, and certainly to what God is up to in the aggregate, the corporate, the community, being part of something that is greater than us. Paying attention, not to how many followers we have on Twitter or Instagram, but how many disciples of Jesus Christ exist now because of them clearly seeing Jesus Christ lived through us. The collective humility and willingness Vulnerability certainly is a part of that, to prefer others over ourselves. And what's really neat about this, the Apostle Paul says, is that God's power to redeem through us, when we live on one accord, it's not dependent on any one person's presence. Apostle Paul is saying, I'm not, I'm not there with you, but God is still God. Now, that is not to minimize my presence nor your presence, like going back to the analogy of the horses, it's nice to have two to pull that 24,000. So not minimizing that, but just accentuating, please don't get lost in that, I want to just accentuate the point of what can happen when there's collective unity. Paul is saying, listen, just as you have always obeyed, keep grinding, even more so without my presence, because at the end of the day, it's God's power that is at work in us to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Pay, pay attention. Hold firmly as a community to the word of life, verse 16 says, to Jesus and do so without complaining. We all have something to complain about. We have a reason, I'm sure, that we can murmur or, or just have a gripe, but hold on to the author and the finisher of our faith. Serve the Lord with gladness, Psalm 100 says, and watch as God uses you, uses me, uses us collectively as proof that he is real. And might I say not to wait, I'm guilty of this, not to wait until circumstances get better to get started. When I get over this cold, when I finish grad school, when I get married, when I you know, get uh, that house, when I get debt free in, 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 in my world of, of academia and education, it's when I finish you know, graduate school, when I get tenure, when I get full, full professor, when I, when I, when I, when I. We'll end up like the man in the Gospels, Luke chapter 9, 59, who when the Lord said, follow me, he says, first, let me go. And it was a good thing. He wanted to go bury his father. A good thing, an understandable thing. And yet God's answer, Jesus' answer was, let the dead bury their own dead. Point being, there's always going to be something that you say, first, let me. When I get through this, when I, when I, when this pandemic is over, then we will. Paul could have easily said, we know what, when I get out of prison, we're going to set it off, right? But as we talked about last week, he didn't do that. He let his pain, he let God use his pain for a pulpit to advance the gospel. What does that look like for you? And what does it look like for me? What does it look like for us? As a community, we could have waited until this pandemic was over to start purchasing property. There would have been reason if we can't, we, we could have come up with reasons to wait. And yet there's a family right now who will very soon benefit from our partnering with God to see them experience victorious living here in the earth. I'll say more about that later. 
What more might God be saying to us in the midst of this pandemic? I know it breeds burnout. I know it breeds cynicism, despair, exasperation. This pandemic I know breeds hopelessness. I don't need to tell you that this pandemic is breeding uh, and exacerbating things like oppression and marginalization. I don't need to tell you that this pandemic is no joke or that racism is no joke. And the exacerbation of such in this space and time is no joke. I don't necessarily need to say that, but maybe I need to remind all of us that God's power is made perfect in our weakness. Let us together pay attention, fixing our eyes on Jesus, our gaze, the psalmist says, on the beauty of the Lord, inquiring in his temple. Because he lives, the old song says, it's because he lives I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. And because I know who holds the future, and then my life is worth living just because he lives. Let's pay, let's pay attention. In closing, while Paul was commending Timothy and, and Epaphroditus at the end of this chapter, he says in verse 21, For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. And he was essentially saying, Timothy is not like that. But how many of us know how easy it is, how in many ways rewarded we are to get ours? So much about the cultural trappings say to leave everybody else behind, to snatch that toy from our sibling when they're crying and they're not looking. How much are we actually reinforced for that behavior? And yet in Christ, as we often say, our lives are to be lived in a countercultural way. I can remember uh, back to 2003 at this point when I started my career as a school counselor. Some of the best advice that I had received uh, was, Paul, as you go into this space, as you help others reach their goals, you'll find that your all of your goals will get met. As you help those teachers figure out how to keep a student in the class and engaged, as you help that principal sort of meet the, the goals that he or she has that, that that central administration is wanting them to report back on. As you help that parent work with that child to not to be off the streets, as you help others, you'll find that the goals that you had and the ideas you had about how you can serve this community, you'll find that you got a team now helping you to advance those goals. As you serve others, watch what might happen. And that advice that guidance is similar now to even our walks in Jesus Christ. And did I ever learn then, thankfully early on and continuing to learn now, that teammates matter? Something that struck me in verse 22 is what Paul, uh, what he says about Timothy. He says, he served with me. Couldn't help but think of the late Bernie Mac when he said, who are you with? And that question I pose to you, who are you with? Who's serving with you? To what larger vision are you committed? And what's really awesome about that is that when we take care of Jesus's business, when collectively we think about not just what I got to get and where I'm going and what would be, yes, ambition isn't all bad and certainly have a plan to participate well in, in the success God has for you. Yes. But when there's this larger corporate community of which you are a part, this larger vision that is pursuing the cause of Christ, what I've learned is in learning is that as we take care of Jesus's business, he will more than take care of ours, more than, which isn't our motive, by the way, for taking care of Jesus's business. It's our reasonable service, as Romans 12 says, but that ought to be encouraging in terms of the things we pay attention to. So may we, Victory Church fam and friends, may we pay attention, pay attention to each other, in every season, but no doubt, especially in this season. Pay attention to the interests of others. Pay attention to how God can use us collectively to make a difference. Now, there are many ways in our community to pay attention, many ways. We as a church have, we try to do our part and there are many parts. One part together that we've been doing is partnering with neighbors, as I alluded to earlier, in our Charlottesville community to experience victorious living. Driven by the love of Jesus Christ, we've purchased our first residential property. 
prayerfully of many, uh, so that we can come alongside brilliant, hardworking neighbors in a way that allows them to breathe a bit while making that living. That allows them not to have to give 90% of their income to rent because we can make sure of that because collectively we said we're going to pay cash for these spaces and control what, what people will have to pay so that there can be empowerment and through the love of Jesus Christ even more so beyond just them occupying that dwelling. That's one part, just one. There are so many. If you want to partner with that, by the way, that in addition to your regular worship through giving, which if you look in the, the chat box, you can see a link for that. You can also look at the particular fund that we currently have set up that says future properties that will allow us to collectively facilitate the empowerment of our neighbors in Jesus's name. In Jesus' name, what are we paying attention to? May God help us, fam and friends, to pay attention in a way that we will pull 24, 48, 120,000 pounds in our community. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word that encourages us and inspires us. We believe, according to 2 Timothy 3 and 16, that it is the inspired word of God, useful for teaching, correcting building up, training up in righteousness. And so we thank you for the word this morning that has allowed us to experience that. And not just in this 29 minutes, but even more so beyond this moment as we dig in ourselves. Show us more of you. For those of us who are new to paying attention to the things of the kingdom of God, I pray that you would add to our faith, as First Peter talks about. For those of us who have been uh, 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 serving in this capacity and walking with Christ for a long time. God, I pray that there be a refresh button in this season for us to pay attention in ways that allow us to see exceeding and abundantly above all that we could have ever asked or thought, which Ephesians talks about. And for those, Lord, who have yet to pay attention at all, may this be an invitation for them to pray the prayer in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, to confess with their mouths and believe to confess with their mouths that Jesus is Lord, to believe in their hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead, and to become a new creation so that through you, we can be more than conquerors. So that through you, as a part of community, we can see the supernatural done, the supernatural on display. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Victory fam and friends, we love you. Uh, we are grateful for those of you who were able most recently uh, in terms of paying attention. We were paying attention to The Color of Compromise, a book written by Jamar Tisby about the church's complicity and racism. And we're paying attention as a church community to how the church in the past hasn't done so great a job and how moving forward we can be better disciples of Christ. Thank you for engaging in what is no doubt a lifelong conversation as and as Jamar Tisby even referenced in the book we are now invited to further study of what it looks like as an extension of our faith in Jesus Christ to steward the ministry of reconciliation first first Corinthians 15 and 57 talks about we're learning we're growing we're sharpening and that process by the way is messy so much messier than the, the nice pictures that we might be able to post every now and then on our social media and website, which is not ingenuous. It is disingenuous. It is very genuine. But the, it, the process of doing life, the process of sitting with, the process of hearing, the process of having vulnerability laid out on the table, oh, not pretty. And yet, damn, I am grateful to be in a community where we can do just that, see bonds strengthen in Jesus' name, and see all of us in our faith walk, no matter race, color, creed, disability, whatever the status, we could see all of us moving forward together and seeing God's name be praised. At the end of the day, we want to give him glory and we want to give him praise. We love you, fam. Uh, if you're missing our victory worship team like I am, uh, I'm going to play on our way out uh, <coughs> a song they recorded. <coughs> called Waymaker. Um, Victory Worship, thank you for continuing to lead us even in this time. But as we close, fam, let's live in victory, remembering who it is that has already won the victory and who it is who makes the way and just allows us the privilege of adding our two cents and participating 
in the ways he's gifted us to do so. Blessings. Feel it your way.